Welcome to the recorded lecture for the lab on the cardiovascular system. Once again, we have a snow day that has gotten in the way of our regular learning. So this is gonna count as the lecture portion of what would have happened during lab today. So you need to watch this prior to the makeup lab on Thursday. This is showing you a photograph of a heart in its natural position in the chest. You can see that the heart is kind of in the center here. You can actually see a couple of the blood vessels wrapping around it. You can notice that it's behind the ribs, between the lungs, above the digestive tract. The pericardium is the covering around the heart that's been cut away so that the heart itself is able to be exposed. This is showing you a cartoon version of what everything looks like here. You can see the heart is directly above the diaphragm. The heart has four, well, three major vessels that we can see here that are feeding into and out of it. We have the superior vena cava. The fourth vessel would have been the um, inferior vena cava. The superior vena cava is gonna pull the blood down from the top of your body and from your arms down towards your heart to drain the blood back to the heart. The inferior vena cava is going to bring it up from the um, lower abdomen, from the legs back to the heart. So they are both large veins. The pulmonary trunk includes the blood vessels that are the veins and the arteries that go between the heart and the lungs. And the aorta is your largest uh, vessel that is artery-like. It is going to send the blood from the heart back through the body. You can see the left and the right lung located here. You can notice that the heart does have an apex or kind of a point to the bottom of it. And once again, like we saw in the last picture, the pericardium has been cut away. And the function of the pericardium is that it protects, anchors, and prevents overfilling of the heart with blood. So it's the sac around the heart muscle that keeps the heart functioning properly. We're gonna to touch on the circulatory system today in lab, and then you are going to go over the, some more about the circulatory system in lecture. You will cover even more about the circulatory system in either animal physiology or human anatomy and physiology. Uh, whenever you take those courses. Your circulatory system has two main primary functions. The first is that it transports all of the necessary materials to all of the cells in the animal's body. Now, what kinds of materials? This is gonna be things like oxygen. The red blood cells you know are going to carry oxygen. But the blood is also gonna carry the nutrients, the sugars, and other necessary products around the body. It's gonna carry hormones, neurotransmitters, other types of signals from one part of the body to the next. The circulatory system also is important for transporting waste products away from the cells so that they can later be released from the body into the environment. Well, what types of waste products? Carbon dioxide is gonna be picked up in the body, taken to the lungs, where it is then going to be exported to the environment as you exhale. Nitrogen waste is gonna be picked up from out the body, and the nitrogen waste is gonna be sent to the kidneys to be processed, to the bladder, and then will be excreted from the body. Other things are going to be picked up by the blood to be removed, they're gonna be taken to the liver to detoxify things, and that's just kind of how your waste products are gonna be related to circulatory system. What are the parts, though, of your circulatory system? I want you to think for a moment. Hopefully you got the heart. And then we have our three types of vessels, the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. It's important to remember that our circulatory system is closed. You may have learned if you took general biology one about organisms with open circulatory systems, but ours is closed. Closed means that the blood and the interstitial fluid are physically separated from each other. 
the blood is actually in vessels in the body. It's not able to flow everywhere. It must flow within the vessels. Organisms with an open circulatory system have large sinus cavities that the blood is going to be pushed through. It more of it sloshes around as opposed to really being pushed through the system. Our circulatory system has some very distinct features. As I mentioned on the last slide, our circulatory system is closed, which means that blood remains inside of the vessels for distribution. We have one contractile muscular heart. This is true for most other vertebrates, as well as the cephalopod group, which includes the octopus group and the squid, and earthworms, except earthworms have five hearts not just one. And a lot of these other features are true for those groups as well. Solutes are exchanged with the environment and the body cells. The blood contains disease fighting cells and molecules. So your white blood cells are gonna fight diseases. Your circulatory system can be adjusted to match the metabolic demands throughout your body. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about this for a moment. When you are running, where does lots of blood end up flowing? Towards your legs. But is there as much blood flow to your stomach perhaps then? No, not at all. Your body is going to modulate how it is flowing blood through the whole body in order to get it to the cells that need it the most. Now the opposite would be true if you had just had a very large meal your body is going to concentrate blood flow to the stomach to help with digestion and then to the small intestines to help with absorption of nutrients. And it's gonna decrease blood flow to other areas. Your blood, because it has platelets in it, has the capacity to clot when you are wounded. So it is able to heal the damage to itself. And our circulatory systems grow in size as the animals who have them grow in size. So as you went from a small infant to a human being, a full-size human being, your circulatory system had to get larger. That's just part of how this works. If you had the same blood flow that you had as an infant, it wouldn't work too well at this point in time in your life. The same patterns exist to the blood flow, but the size of the entire system has grown. Our circulatory system has a double circulation to it. This is also found in crocodiles, in birds, and other mammals. And this double circulation means that there are two distinct circuits of blood flow. Blood that is oxygenated makes up one. This is blood that contains high levels of oxygen in it. This is the blood that's gonna be coming from the lungs to the heart, to the rest of the body. And then we have our deoxygenated blood system. This is going to be coming from the body to the heart, to the lung. This is blood that is depleted in oxygen. It's been through the whole body, which has decreased the amount of available oxygen in the blood. We call these systems the systemic, um, and then we have a systemic system. We also have a pulmonary system. Your systemic system is going to take the blood to the body and your pulmonary takes it to your lungs and back from your lungs. So we have deoxygenated and oxygenated circuits, but then we also have different systems. Systemic to the body and pulmonary to the lungs. You can have different blood pressures for the systemic system and the pulmonary system. That's perfectly fine. And it's worth noting that we have a heart with four chambers. That means we have two atria, the upper chambers, and two ventricles, the lower chambers. We also have um, animals that share this four-chambered heart. 
but there are other animals that have a two or a three chambered heart. So four chambered heart is not found in all animals. The way that our blood flows is that it's going to flow from the body into the right atrium. It's then going to collect the blood in the right atrium. That blood is then going to be pumped into the right ventricle. Blood will then move from the right ventricle into the lungs. It then moves from the lungs to the left atrium and to the left ventricle and then out to the body. This means that the atrium, regardless of whether or not it's a right or left, is in charge of collecting blood from the tissues, while a ventricle is responsible for pumping blood out of the tissues to the rest of the body. Your oxygenated cycle is going to include the left atrium and the left ventricle, whereas your deoxygenated circuit is going to include the right atrium and the right ventricle. You can see on the picture here that the deoxygenated is the blue and the oxygenated blood is the red. The blood is pumped from the heart out through the aorta, through the arteries to the rest of the body, and then at the capillaries, the smallest vessels, is where the materials that are in the blood are going to be exchanged with other body cells. Leaving the capillaries, the blood is going to be deoxygenated and it's going to return back to the heart via the veins, where it enters the right atrium, the right ventricle, to the lungs, to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, back through the aorta, back out to the body in a continuing cycle. The vertebrate heart, as I mentioned, contains the atria, which are your upper chambers that receive blood, and the ventricles, which are your lower chambers, where the blood is going to leave the heart. You will discover that your right and left sides of your heart are separated by a thick tissue called the septum. It's a thick muscular tissue. Blood enters the atrium from either the systemic or the body circuit or the pulmonary system, the lungs. The valves between the atrium and the ventricle are called AV valves or atrioventricular valves. The right AV valve is called the tricuspid. The left AV valve is called the mitral. These valves allow for one way flow of blood. They allow it to move from the atrium to the ventricle, but not to then slosh back into an atrium. The semilunar valves are the valves that are between the ventricles and the arteries that they empty into. The right one is called the pulmonary valve. This is going to go from the right ventricle into the lungs. And the left semilunar valve is the aortic valve. This goes between the left ventricle and the aorta. The aorta and the pulmonary artery then allow blood to leave the heart. The aorta is going to take blood through the systemic circulation, sending it to the body, whereas the pulmonary artery is going to take the blood to the lungs in order to get oxygenated. The pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein work differently than all of the other arteries and the veins in the body. In general, arteries carry oxygenated blood, but the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood. In general, veins carry deoxygenated blood, except the pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood. They're different because they are not part of that systemic circuit. They're part of the pulmonary circuit. This is another picture of what the heart looks like. You can see better here a little bit the veins and arteries that come and go from the heart, as well as the very distinct right and left atrium and right and left ventricle.
this picture shows you how blood is going to be flowing through the heart and the associated veins and arteries. Notice that the blue blood is deoxygenated blood, whereas the red blood does contain the oxygen necessary for life. So everything that's blue blood is going to go towards the lungs and the red is then going to go towards the body. Because you have double circulation, your heart is also a double pump. It's going to pump deoxygenated blood to the lungs to get the oxygen as part of the pulmonary circuit. And it's going to pump oxygenated blood then to the rest of the body via the systemic circuit. This is a way to look at the difference between the pulmonary and the systemic circuits. You can see that both of them involved arteries and veins, as well as capillaries. But you do see the difference between the red and blue veins here. And you remember the red carries the oxygenated blood and blue is deoxygenated. So you see that the deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and then the red oxygenated blood is going to flow back to the heart. From there, it flows to the body. At the capillaries, we have that exchange of oxygen with the body tissues and then the deoxygenated blood is going to flow back to the heart. The right ventricles have deoxygenated blood that they send to the lung. The left ventricles have oxygenated blood that they have received from the lungs. One of the things that we're going to talk about today and that you're going to briefly get to examine is blood pressure. Blood pressure is going to be related to blood flow as well as resistance. Blood pressure is defined as the force exerted by blood on the walls of the blood vessels. So this is how much pressure, that force, that the blood is forcing upon the blood vessels themselves. Blood pressure is higher in arteries than it is in veins. This is because arteries are closer themselves to the muscular heart. And when we talk about blood pressure, we're usually discussing our arterial blood pressure, so the blood pressure of the arteries. Resistance is going to be the tendency of the blood vessels to slow down the flow of blood. The types of things these could be are the radius of the vessels, the length of the vessels, and also the blood viscosity, so how thick the blood is. These are physical characteristics that determine the amount of blood that flows through a vessel, but also how quickly it flows through a vessel. The diameter of vessels do change or does change. Vessels can dilate and become larger or they can constrict and become smaller. The viscosity is measured by the hemocrypt, which is the concentration of red blood cells. We measure blood flow as the change in pressure divided by resistance. We do this over the length of a vessel when we measure that change in pressure. So it's going to be over a set area that we're going to calculate blood flow. You will not be calculating blood flow as part of this lab, but it's important for you to know how it is calculated. So blood pressure, flow, and resistance are very clearly related to each other. We can change the resistance of the arteries as a way of controlling blood flow. The changing of the length of vessels and the viscosity of blood, those things don't change in the short term. So if you want to change something quickly, you can't change the length of your vessels and you likely can't change the viscosity of your blood. So you're going to change then the radius of the blood vessels themselves. And the radius is going to be the most important factor of the blood vessel when it comes to controlling blood flow. 
In vasodilation, the radius of the arteries is going to increase. It's going to get larger. That means the arteries are going to dilate. In vasoconstriction, it's the opposite. There's going to be a decrease in the radius of the blood vessels because the artery is going to get narrower. The radius of the arteries or that arterial radius is controlled by hormones, by input from the nervous system, and by locally produced substances. These locally produced substances include metabolic byproducts. These are things that are made by your metabolism that are given off that are not necessarily the goal of the metabolism, but these are the byproducts that can be given off. These include things like carbon dioxide and lactic acid. Potassium ions are also involved in arterial radius um, alterations. The potassium ions can cause vasodilation almost immediately. And vasodilation is going to allow for higher rates of metabolism because there's going to be higher blood flow supporting oxygen levels and other things in the cells themselves. We can measure systemic blood pressure. And this is what we often do when we measure blood pressure. There is a garden hose analogy for this. In the garden hose analogy, the faucet is the heart, whereas the hose acts as the arteries. The maximum cardiac output or the maximum CO is when you have unblocked arteries. That's when you have high flow and thus high water or high blood pressure. When you have a constricted hose, you have high resistance. This high resistance is going to lead to higher pressure above the constriction and lower pressure after the constriction. So in the normal situation, you were just turning on the hose and letting it spray. In the constricted um, hose example, you've kind of pinched your fingers around the hose so that you've reduced the amount of water that's flowing through the hose. You find that the pressure that's on the side before that constriction or before that resistance is going to be much higher than what is after that point. And then if you were to kind of really pinch off the hose by bringing two sides kind of together and actually keeping the water from flowing through the hose, you will see that you've greatly increased the cardiac output, um, or no, I'm sorry, you've greatly increased the resistance and you may find that you have almost no pressure coming through, which means that there's a lot of pressure on the other side of that vein. The greater your cardiac output, the greater, or the higher the R is going to be, so the higher the radius, and the higher the blood pressure. Arterial pressure, then becomes a function of how hard your heart works. So how much is it pumping? How fast is it pumping? How often is it pumping? And then how constricted and dilated the arterioles are. Those arterioles are like smaller arteries. Your blood circuit, your circulatory system, is able to adapt very well to life. The cardiovascular system has the ability to adapt basically to constantly changing conditions. Well, what kinds of conditions? So first of all, we have sleep, um, sudden activity, emergencies, exercise, sitting up, laying down, sitting down. These positional changes are gonna require changes in your blood pressure. When you exercise, blood is going to be routed to where it is needed, not to the cells where it is not needed. When you're exercising, you are unlikely to be 
digesting your food because you've probably done that a while beforehand. Many of you may realize if you try to exercise on a full stomach, your stomach may start to hurt. This is because you're not going to be digesting the food as much because of the exercise. There's a balance of vasodilation and vasoconstriction in exercise with some vessels becoming dilated and others becoming constricted. We find that when you exercise, there's an increase in the heart rate or in the heart stroke volume. So either in the rate the blood is pumped through the body or the quantity of blood that is pumped through the body. Epinephrine can be very useful in that. The um, hormones from your adrenal gland can help with this because they bind to the receptors on the heart ventricular cell muscles, which is going to cause them to react vigorously and increase your stroke volume, or it binds to the SA node in the heart and it then increases the heart rate. Your blood pressure overall won't rise necessarily by too much as you move through things because the skeletal muscles only allow the blood vessels to dilate so far. And there's only so much we can do to increase our blood pressure level safely. So what are you going to be doing for today's lab? We have some slight modifications to the instructions that we're going to go through as we go through finishing this up. So the first part of the lab that we're going to do is the actual heart dissection. For this, you're going to be starting at step five because there's no pericardium on these hearts that was in fact previously removed for you. We are working with fresh pig hearts. This means that they're not going to smell like bad chemicals. If they smell like anything at all, it's going to be if they smell like fresh meat. This is the point where I'm going to remind you of your safety instructions. You should and must wear gloves during today's lab. You are welcome to wear a lab coat if you'd like. I will also have eye protection available for you. You're going to show either myself or if there's another professor here, them, or if there's a TA here, them, all of the structures that are on the next two slides before you leave. This is part of your assignment for today. So the first set of structures you need to find are all external structures, the left and right atria, the left and right ventricles, the apex or the point of the heart, the auricles, the pulmonary trunk, which are arteries, the pulmonary veins, and then both the superior and inferior vena cavas that return blood flow to the heart from the body, the aorta and the brachiocephalic arch. You can see some pictures of it here. There's also pictures in your lab manual that will help you identify all of these features. There are then the internal features you're going to look for. The septum I mentioned previously, that's the interventricular septum or the IVS. You're also going to be able to find your AV valves and your semilunar valves. So you have the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve, the pulmonary valve, and potentially the aortic valve. You should be able to find that one as well. You'll also find the cordidae tendidae, which are the heart strings, as they're actually kind of known as the way that you're used to thinking about them and they're going to be with the valve structures. You can see in the picture here of the photograph here of the red heart, that's what you're going to be looking at today, kind of like that one. The gray heart picture that is next to it is pictures of when we used to use preserved hearts. Thankfully, we no longer do, um, and those smell bad, so this one will in fact not but you can see the septum in that gray picture remarkably well. In the reddish picture, you can see the chordidae tendini that are right there, those heartstrings that are right there and visible. 
you can also see the papillary muscles that are involved in opening and shutting the valves. The AV valves are gonna be kept from being pushed into the atria because of these strands, these heart strings. Those keep them in place and keep the valves from being pulled into either of the other structures of the heart. So when you're dissecting your heart, how are you going to find the major vessels? Well, you may be able to see them, but one of the easiest things you can do to identify which major vessel it is, is to stick your finger or a probe into the opening to see where it's coming from. You're gonna be wearing gloves, so you're gonna be safe as you're doing this. You'll find that the anterior vena cava and the posterior vena cava both go into the right atria. Right atrium, that is. The pulmonary arteries leave from the right ventricle. The pulmonary veins enter in through the left atrium and the aorta is going to come out of the left ventricle. The next thing you're going to do is, and actually you can do this prior to arriving to class, that's fine with me. You're going to do the web anatomy quizzes. They can be found at the website here and they're found under the cardiovascular section. You're going to do all of the exercises that are indicated in the lab manual on page 98. You are going to take screenshots or actual photographs with your cell phone of your computer screen and you're gonna paste those directly into a Word document for me. You're also going to answer all of the questions on page 98 of the lab manual. For doing this, you should follow the guidelines of what's listed in the lab manual. Once again, you're encouraged to do this before lab if you'd like. Part two is measuring blood pressure, for which we'll be doing a modified lab. The arterial pressure is going to fluctuate during the cardiac cycle. Systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, you've heard of most likely before. Systolic pressure is the maximum pressure in the artery when it contracts. This is during the peak of the ventricular ejection of blood. The diastolic pressure is the minimum pressure in the artery during relaxation. This is just before the ventricular ejection begins again. Arterial pressure is measured as systolic over diastolic, or on average, 120 over 80. We can also measure pulse pressure, and pulse pressure equals the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. This is felt on your pulse points in either the wrist or the neck, and a pulse wave, well, is really a pressure, a pulse is really a pressure wave which we feel. This is due to the alternating expansion and recoil of arteries during the cardiac cycle. So the blood is pushed through, they expand, and then they contract, expand and contract. And that pressure wave is the pulse that we feel. Pulses are felt by compressing the artery against a firm tissue at specific pressure points. And this allows for an easy way to then count your heart rate. The pulse of a healthy man is 66 beats a minute when laying down, 70 beats a minute when standing up, 80 beats a minute when you suddenly stand up, and between 140 to 180 beats per minute with vigorous exercise or emotional upset. So, you see that there's more than just exercise that affects blood flow. You measure blood pressure with the sphygmometer. With it, you're going to utilize the bulb. And as you squeeze the bulb, it is going to increase the pressure in the inflatable rubber cuff by blowing it up. As it blows up, this is going to contract around the blood vessels. It's going to contract them down and it's going to eventually stop the blood flow. And then you will back off on the pressure and you'll have been able to record a blood pressure. 
So how do you measure blood pressure? First of all, you inflate that cuff to create pressure. And when that pressure is greater than the systolic pressure, it's going to compress the artery, which is gonna to lead to no blood flow then because your artery is compressed. You'll start by deflating the cuff slowly. And as you do, the pressure in the cuff and the pressure in the artery then are going to drop, allowing blood flow to happen again. When the cuff, cuff pressure falls just below the systolic pressure, the artery starts to reopen slightly, allowing blood flow to restart. This pressure is where you hear that first sound with a cuff. We call it the systolic blood pressure. When the cuff pressure lowers to diastolic pressure, you're gonna find that all of your sounds stop because blood flow is continuous now and non-turbulent, therefore. So these are the sounds that you'll be able to hear when measuring blood pressure this way. Now, these were the instructions for the blood pressure lab, but we're gonna to have to do a modified version because we're pressed for time. Your modified blood pressure instructions are to find a partner. You're both gonna practice taking your blood pressure on each other, and you're going to answer the following questions in your written assignment. That means you're probably gonna to need to do internet research in order to find the answers. First question, what is the impact of exercise on blood pressure? Second question, is your BP higher standing up, laying down, or sitting? And third, other than posture and exercise, what are 10 other things that can raise your blood pressure? You are welcome to use the internet or your textbook or other books as a resource to try and figure out the answers to these questions. These answers are gonna be written up and turned in with your write-up. The last part of today's lab is that you're gonna do an analysis of your risk for cardiovascular disease. You're gonna fill out the questionnaire for the male or female at the end of the lab manual, uh, which ever you are is the one you're going to fill out. And you're then going to assess the risks, risks that you have for cardiovascular disease. This is something you can do prior to the lab as well. You're welcome to do this before lab. You will have to show this to me or to Sarah to prove that you've done it. However, you do not, we're not gonna really be reading your answers. We're just looking to see whether or not you've filled it out. This is really something for you to reflect upon. So what is the write-up for this lab? It's first worth noting that this lab is due next week. So it's due next Wednesday at two. You're gonna submit it through Brightspace in the cardiovascular folder. It's worth 15 points. And this is an individual assignment. Every one of you is going to submit your own answers. And even though you may have had a partner for a portion of this, your answers are expected to really be different. You're gonna type up the answers that have been mentioned through this, the ones on the blood pressure, and then the ones on page 98 of the lab manual. And then you're also going to show either Sarah or myself your answers to the heart disease worksheet. Once again, we're not reading it, we're just seeing that you've done it. Thanks for your attention on this, and I hope you have had a wonderful snow day.